Good morning, everyone. Um, it's now just shortly after 10 o'clock, so we'll make a start and hopefully a few people will trickle in um, as, as we get going. So um, my name is Amy Stokes. Um, I am a partner in the employment team and I head up the immigration side of the team. I have today with me uh, my colleague, Marianne Hesse. And um, she is also a solicitor in the employment team and she is a specialist in business immigration. We've got a lot of information to share with you today. We plan to speak for about 45 minutes and then we've got 15 minutes at the end for some questions. If you did want to ask any questions as we go through, um, if you just use the Q&A function, um, we'll look at those at the end. Um, hopefully we'll cover quite a bit of the different points today, but if there's something that jumps out that you want to ask a question on, then please do pop it in there. We did have some questions in advance and we are dealing with those as we go through the event today. Um, but if there's anything else, then then, then if you use that function, that'd be great. We will be circulating the slides after this session, so there's no need to take copious notes. And also um, this event is being recorded as well, so we'll circulate that afterwards. Um, so you'll have that for your records. So today's a big day, um, and that's not only because England have finally beaten Germany in a knockout competition for the first time since 1966, but also, and um, for immigration lawyers like Marianne and I, it's an exciting day because it's deadline day for EU citizens to apply to the EU settlement scheme to secure their status to live and work in the UK. And as the dust settles on that scheme, it would appear that there are around 1.5 million more EU citizens in the UK than the government in, um, initially anticipated. And it's also estimated that tens, if not hundreds of thousands of those have not actually yet applied to the scheme. Um, so today we're going to discuss the next steps for employers who employ EU citizens and the government guidance on the EU settlement scheme um, and right to work checks that was updated and released last week. So it's all hot off the press. So a little bit of an agenda of what we'll go through today. Going to start off by talking you through the impact of the new immigration system um, and what the changes have been to that in general, as well as the EU settlement scheme. Then Marianne's going to talk you through deadline day for the EU settlement scheme applications and what the next steps for that are. And um, we've had some interesting um, um, developments in that that were not previously anticipated. In addition to that, um, the key changes following the new um, government home office government guidance, the changes to right to work check process, um, list A and list B and the online checking service as well. And throughout this, uh, Marianne and I are obviously immigration lawyers, so we're going to share with you our practical steps um, and tips that we have in our experience in working with, um, certainly with the new system for the last few months and what we anticipate to be um, the changes going forward and practically how that will impact you and your organisations. Then we'll have some time at the end to talk about business travel post Brexit. It's been something that, um, again, there have been a number of changes through this year. And as the um, as the world opens up a little bit more post pandemic, and um, business travel is something that will be on the agenda again for a number of organisations. So how that's going to look now that EU free movement of people between the UK and the EU have has come to an end. And then at the end, we'll talk about visa options. So what the alternative options are for looking at um, engaging non-UK citizens who work in the UK and other visa options as well, if you are um, looking at business travel, et cetera. So to, stick us, to, to kick us off, um, I kind of wanted to, I thought this timeline was quite interesting to see how we've got to this point, how we've got to this exciting deadline day. So as you can see from the slide, and as we all well know, the UK left the EU on the 31st of January, 2020. At that stage, we entered the transition period during which not a lot changed. And that ended on the 31st of December last year. And the rules governing the new relationship between the EU and the UK took effect from the 1st of January, 2021. And that importantly included the end of free movement between the UK and the EU. Just before this, on the 1st of December 2020, there was also a complete overhaul of the sponsored worker routes. New rules came into place um, and for those um, under those routes uh, whose start date in the UK would have been on or after the 1st of January this year. Marianne's going to talk you through the impact of these immigration changes. Um, so, um, so that's for those who applied from January this year. 
On the 31st of December, um, the deadline for EU nationals to arrive in the UK who wish, that's the deadline for them who wish to take up their home, um, entering on or before that date meant that they would be eligible to, eligible to apply under the EU settlement scheme, the scheme that's closing today. On the 1st of January this year, EU nationals entering the UK now need to either enter as a visa and be aware of the restrictions this entails, um, sorry, as a visitor and be aware of the restrictions that entails or, or, or hold a visa um, to enable them to enter. And then today's date, so the 30th of June, um, at this, that is the end of the grace period for EU nationals to make an application under that scheme. So due, due to the grace period, EU nationals could actually continue to use their passports and ID cards as evidence to their right, of their right to work to this point. And employers were not able to request to see any evidence of application to the EU settlement scheme. And from tomorrow, um, there will be the new right to work check provisions that come into force. And that's really what we're going to discuss in today's webinar. So Marianne's just now going to take you through the impact of the immigration changes. Hi, yes, good morning, everyone. So we have already started seeing impacts of these new changes. And the main change, of course, being the fact that EU nationals and non-EU nationals are now treated equally, which, which was one of the key pillar stones of the Brexit campaign. Unless, of course, the EU national is eligible under the EU settlement scheme to apply. Now, because of this main change, the right to work check process has also had to change. It's now no longer sufficient as of tomorrow for an EU national to simply wave their passport or ID card at you as the employer to evidence their right to work. The third point on this list here is the abolishment of the resident labour market test or the RLMT. So just as a quick overview of the previous process of the RLMT, many of you may have been aware that roles had to be advertised for 28 days on specified media. And this was often in addition to your own recruitment drive because the Home Office mandated certain criteria. Under these new rules, the processing for recruiting skilled workers is in our view much quicker. And we have been seeing that recruiting of overseas nationals is now one to one and a half months faster than previously. It does seem as though the government has recognised that there will be a labour shortage and it's therefore lowered the minimum salary threshold and the level of qualifications required, along with scrapping the overall cap on numbers of skilled workers coming into the UK. The new process for recruiting an overseas national appears to be now more, more straightforward and smoother. And this might be why we're actually seeing an increase in sponsor life application numbers. So on this point, <clears throat> Excuse me. On this point, the number of sponsored applications in quarter four of 2020 was just over 2,600 in that one quarter. And in quarter one of this year, there was over 3,500 applications going in. When you compare this with previous quarters, which were around the 12 to 1,400 mark, you can clearly see the significant increase. The cost and time for applying for a sponsor license should be considered in any business plan because the processing times for an application is around eight weeks under the standard processing times. However, unfortunately, we have been seeing applications take longer and the Home Office is deeming applications as complex when, in our view, they should not have been done so. The priority service is also available, which should reduce the working times for 10 working days. However, in order to be successful in this, we have been experiencing employers sending applications in to the priority line at midnight just to be one of the first few received that day. This does cost an extra £500 to be in, in, the, in the ballot almost to be approved for that day and the cost of this should also be factored in too, especially if you are time pressured into hiring an overseas national. The final point on the impact of the new immigration changes is slightly controversial in some respects. You may have seen some of the news articles of EU nationals being detained at the border. Now, this is due likely to be confusion over the permitted activities that are allowed under the visitor rules that are now subject to the, well, the EU nationals are now subject to from the 1st of January. This confusion is understandable given that up until today, EU nationals have still been using their passports and ID cards as right to work evidence. We will discuss that shortly in this webinar. So today, the main reason and cause for this webinar is deadline day for EU settlement scheme applications. The grace period is ending today, 30th of June, and this is following the transition period end on the 31st of December. 
The grace period really was afforded to those people who may have arrived late on last year, and it's given them, them time to settle down, find permanent accommodation, and also to receive official documentation, which they will need in their EU settlement scheme applications. There are certain limited exceptions as to when an EU national will be allowed to apply late to the scheme. We've listed some on the screen, um, and obviously some of these are quite serious examples, uh, victims of modern slavery or abusive relationship um, people in those situations, or people having serious medical condition problems or treatments, and of course, people suffering from mental or physical incapacity. The government has recruited around 70 organisations to actually reach out to vulnerable people and um, to, to help them with the scheme. Um, a lesser and not a serious point to note is that somebody simply might not have access to the internet, especially if they came in late last year, or they haven't actually settled down in permanent accommodation yet. So this is some of the examples that where a late application might be allowed. As at the 31st of May, and as Amy mentioned, um, there may still be many more to come, uh, there have been around 5.27 million applications concluded under the EU settlement scheme. Six percent of these may actually be repeat applications for people who've been refused and are doing it again, or it's people who have been given pre-settled status and are now upgrading to their settled status. There are around 400,000 outstanding applications to the scheme, and of course, EU case workers are now dealing with a backlog of cases and are inundated with calls on a daily basis. Thanks, Marianne. I think it's interesting, um, the exceptions, um, so where you can apply um, late and, and practically as an organisation, and we'll come on to this later, it's something that you do need to um, understand um, what the exceptions are. So if you do discover that one of your um, current employees um, or, or a prospective employee, when you do the right to work check, hasn't applied to the scheme, you understand the reasons why, and they have left them very wide, very, very wide. And it remains to be seen kind of how they will be, um, how they'll determine whether one of these exceptions applies. So I'm just going to take you through now um, the importance of right to work checks um, and then we'll talk about the current process and what the changes are to that. So as um, I'm sure you're aware, it's unlawful to employ someone who doesn't have the right to reside and the appropriate right to work in the UK or someone who is working in breach of their conditions of stay. Um, so um, the basics of this are that to comply with your obligation as an employer to prevent illegal working, you must um, carry out a right to work check on all prospective employees before employment starts. Then you must conduct um, follow up checks on employees who have time limited permission to live and work in the UK or require, document, um, require a document to evidence their rights, as in the case of a non-EEA family member or EEA um, of a citizen um, or an application pen Ending, keep records of all of those rec checks that are carried out and not employ someone who you know or have a reasonable um, cause to believe is an illegal worker. I think a key point to note there, Amy, as well, as you mentioned, um, even if you undertake the right to work check, so say somebody's due to start at 9am on any day, if they haven't already done the right to work check with you, you should bring them in even at 8.50am and just see the right to work check documents. If they haven't got those documents, strict rules should say they should be sent home and only come back in to the office or wherever they may be working when they have got those documents to evidence to you. Absolutely, Marianne, and it's something that we are regularly asked um, and, and we build into all of the right to work check policies and it's so vital that you have that policy in place so that those who are recruiting, um, who are responsible for recruitment are aware that these people can't start work until you've done that check. If they do, then you are leaving yourself open to potential issues going forward. And that actually brings me um, nicely on to um, to, to the fact that actually, if you do employ someone um, who doesn't have the right to work, um, who, is working in, who is working in breach of their conditions of stay, if you do so knowingly, it is, a, it is you're liable for a civil penalty, but also it's a criminal offence as well. So it's something that should be taken very, very seriously. But um, an employer is excused from paying any civil penalty if you can show that you conducted a proper right to work check. So you, you, you 
um, comply with the prescribed requirements. Um, so the way, so what we call here, this is known as the statutory excuse, you'll see that on the slide. So, and we'll, we'll refer to this as we go through. So if you've carried out a proper right to work check in accordance with the guidance, and then subsequently later, it turns out that the individual, the employee doesn't have the right to work or is working in breach of the conditions of stay, you have this statutory excuse which means that you will not need to pay um, any penalty. So that's why it's so vital that you do it and you hold records of, um, of that right to work check um, as well. So the current process, um, and we'll touch on these points shortly, um, but it only requires British and Irish nationals to provide their passports. Um, EU nationals can choose to provide either their passport or their national ID card if they have one. So this is up until today's date. Um, as long as you're satisfied that that's a genuine document, then that's all that's required. EU, set, uh, EU nationals could also select to share their status under the EU settlement scheme, but employers up to today, um, up to and including today, cannot insist on this. Um, third country nationals who have permanent residence in the UK will likely need to evidence their passport and also their immigration status document, or again, share their online status with you um, if they're eligible. An individual um, may have the option to provide both an online share code or their original documents. Where that's possible, you can't enforce the online check and should accept the original documents, um, carrying out the check in the manual way, which I'm just about to come on to. However, um, where the status is only visible in an online format, um, such as the EU settlement scheme, that is the, um, the exception. And we'll come on to manual checks and list A and list B um, shortly, and Marianne will take you through the online checks as well. But I just wanted to take you through very, very briefly the three steps um, for carrying out a manual right to work check. Um, so this is how you establish that you have that all important statutory excuse. So the first stage um, is the obtain stage. So you obtain pre-employment, the employee's original documents as prescribed in the Home Office guidance from list A or list B on which more later. Um, examples of immigration documents that can be accepted are set out in the guidance that we've got a link to. And the types of documents that are required depends on whether the person has unrestricted rights to live in the UK, so list B, I'm sorry, list A, um, or is subject to some kind of immigration control, so that's list B. Once you've obtained those, you then need to check the documents and you need to check the document in the presence of the prospective employee. That's the normal rule. There is an amended right to work check at the moment because of COVID, again, on which more later. But you should ensure that the document relates to that individual, that the document is original, that it's unaltered and that it's valid. And then the final stage is to copy the document, copy the original documents, not a copy of a copy, a copy of the original document. And that includes both sides of the document if it includes any information, for example, the biometric residence permit. And then you need to record the date of that check and the date of any follow-up checks and retain a copy of the document securely. So that can either be um, in a hard copy or a scanned copy, which importantly, must be in a format that can't be manually altered. So for example, a PDF file or a JPEG file. And when copying passports, you need to only copy any um, page holding the personal details and any page containing government endorsements, not every page of the passport. Again, noting the date of expiry and any relevant UK endorsement that allows the individual to do the type of work for which they're employed. Then you need to retain copy documents um, for the duration of the employment and for two years after. So it's different from the GDPR. Um, there is a specific fixed period of two years after employment has ceased. You'll need to have these um, easily producible to um, any immigration official without delay. So if you have multiple sites um, or branches, these should really be stored electronically and provide access to HR at all the different sites if you, if you suddenly have a visit and, somebody, and they're, they're looking for documents in relation to a particular individual. We are actually going to be running an event later this year, um, a full event on the detail of right to work checks, which would be really, really useful for um, anybody who works in HR or recruitment who's responsible for doing those checks. We're gonna take you through this obtained check copy, talk about looking at validity of documents, different types of documents, all those kind of things. So you will receive um, in the next few weeks, we will set that up and we'll send that through. So um, if anybody's interested in that, then let us know. It would probably be a full morning event and we'll do some practical scenarios on that as well. So Marianne, this day and this be. 
Yes, so as a manual right to work check, um, you have list A and list B, and an employer can only accept one or more of those documents in these lists. Documents in list A should confirm that an individual has permission to live and reside and work in the UK indefinitely, provided that the check was carried out correctly and under the guidance in force at the time, the employer should be able to establish a statutory excuse and will not be required to undertake a further check. List B documents are divided into two groups. So list B group one is for individuals who have a time limited permission to work in the UK. For example, this might be a migrant who is a holder of a biometric residence permit and they have been given a skilled worker visa for three years and they may wish to do the manual check. In this case, the employer will need to see the individual's passport and visa copy to record the expiry date on that visa. And ideally, you should be diarising the date three months in advance of this expiry date so you can prompt the individual to renew their visa. In this scenario, follow-up checks will be required. Documents in list B group two confirms when an employer needs to make an employer checking service request to ensure the individual does have an appeal, application or review pending with the Home Office. And in these circumstances, the employer must request a check to provide it, be given a statutory excuse from the Home Office for a six month period. This six month period should then allow the individual to receive their notice from the Home Office that they do or do not have the right to work. They should also then provide you with this additional permission from the Home Office and you should retain both of these on record. Employers in particular should pay particular attention to group B, uh, sorry, list B group two documents, as this is particularly relevant when you have an individual who has an outstanding application under the EU settlement scheme. So here we have listed the link to the current list A and list B. And uh, as we all are aware, tomorrow this will be changing. So moving on to the online right to work check, this is an alternative option to the manual check. Um, and this can be done on the home office portal. It is only available for certain visa types, for example, biometric residence holders, uh, permit holders, and some immigration status, as Amy mentioned, is only accessible via the online portal, which is an example of the EU settlement scheme's evidence. If the individual has the option to show either physical documentation or, online, or use the online service, just to reconfirm what Amy's mentioned is that it can, you cannot enforce that individual to use the online check. They can use a manual service. So how to do this? The employee will need to activate a share code, which will be live for 30 days, and it can only be used for this purpose. The employer will then need to log into their side of the online system. And their system is called the View a Job Applicant's Right to Work Details. This is the portal you need to use, and you'll need to enter the share code along with the employee's date of birth. The key point is, if you do not use the employer's side of the system, you will not establish a statutory excuse. The system will then show the status of the, of the individual online and will confirm whether they have permanent residence and you don't need to therefore do any further right to work checks or they have a time limited permission in the UK. And in that circumstance, you will need to note that down and later on do a further check on them. The check must be done in the presence of the individual, either in person or via a live video link so that you can check their identity with the documentation or the online system that is showing the documentation there. As with the manual check, you must keep these records on file. You can either print this from the system on the profile settings or you can save it as a PDF or HTML link. <coughs> So the big thing and the reason why we're all here today is the new right to work check process coming into force from tomorrow. Key, key point to note is that for EU nationals, non-EU nationals, sorry, nothing really changes. They can either use the online or manual right to work check process as before. The big change now, of course, is that EU nationals must evidence their digital status with you to start work unless they have immigration permission under a different visa category. As the EU settlement scheme is of status only verified online, you of course permitted to request this proof from them as of tomorrow. 
As mentioned on the previous slide, the check is done via the employer's part of the service and it requires a code from the individual and the date of birth. If the individual has settled status, it will inform you of this. And again, you'll have a statutory excuse for the foreseeable time that you employ them. If they have pre-settled status via the online link, then it will show you on the online portal the, the, date that the, the date that their permission will expire. You will need to complete the check again closer to the time of that ex expiration date. So the third point here is, is, a, is a query that we've had many times leading up to today. As many employers have queried what would happen if they had accepted EU passports or ID cards for a new joiner who started between the 1st of January this year and until now. And this is exactly what you're permitted to do. Of course, the query then is, what happens if we later find out that the individual has not applied to the EU settlement scheme? You may have found this out by doing a retrospective check on everybody, or it may be knowledge passed to you that gives you reasonable belief to assume that they haven't done the, the application. So in this situation, the Home Office has afforded helpfully employers the time until the 31st of December to help their employees rectify this scenario. And actually, they've done this because they recognise employers want to maintain a stable workforce. So if you discover that an EU national has not applied to the scheme, you must ask them to apply to it within 28 days of the discussion that you have with them and of your knowledge with them. And they must provide you with evidence that they have applied. This is likely to be a certificate of application, which you will need to obtain and retain on record. You will also need to do an employer checking service request and keep this, fingers crossed, positive verification notice on file. If you do both of those, you will then receive a statutory excuse for a six month period. Again, if they've genuinely done this, you can continue to employ them for that six month period. And in that time, they should have a decision on the application scheme. If they haven't, unfortunately, applied in that time, you should look at ways of terminating their employment with you. Unfortunately, a downside is that the new guidance on this hasn't quite gone into as much detail for those whose right to work check was done on or before the 30th of June, but actually their start date is the 1st of July onwards. The Home Office has been queried on this and we are expecting a further update shortly. Um, the final point on this slide is just a helpful continuation of the adjusted right to work check, which is the process where the check can be carried out over a video link in the presence of the individual. The Home Office had been delaying this deadline um, in line with the end of the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, however, the Home Office has been liaising with businesses and helpfully the businesses have been saying, we don't expect our workforce to come back into the office before the 1st of September. So fortunately, the Home Office has realized this and um, moved the deadline back to the 31st of August for this adjusted right to work check to be permissible. Amy, I think you're on mute. It wouldn't be a webinar if um, somebody didn't do that at some stage. So at least I've not got a, a dog barking. Thanks for, thanks for that, Marianne. So um, I was just saying um, that um, I'm now going to run through um, the key changes to list A and list B. So this is for the manual right to work checks rather than the online right to work checks. So just a kind of start of what will be removed. So this is what will be removed from tomorrow for your manual checks. So um, so we, we put them in the list there. Um, Crucially, um, the, key, the, the change with the biggest practical impact is that um, EU passports, EEA passports, other than Irish passports or national ID cards will no longer be acceptable documents in order to establish a right to work. Um, the, in addition to that, from list B, um, some, some crucial points there, the EEA family permits is a key one there as well, um, and residence cards issued to um, family members under EU law, um, they've also been removed as well. Um, so things that have been added. Um, so um, the, this, this relates mainly to, um, again, to family members. 
Um, so unexpired documents um, issued by the Home Office to family members um, indicating that they can stay um, indefinitely. Again, um, list A, Irish passports and, um, and, and passport cards, and then documents issued by the Channel Islands confirming settled status under the EU settlement scheme. But again, you're going to need one of these positive verification notices from the um, employer's checking um, service. In addition to that, um, from list B, um, what's been added. So um, the um, unexpired documents issued by the Home Office to family members indicating um, their, their status under the EU settlement scheme. And again, um, a crucial one on there, an interesting one is the addition of frontier worker permits as well. And we're going to talk about that um, when um, later on in, in the session as well and what explain what those are. So um, there is some scope for employers to be a bit confused about whether a biometric residence card's been issued under EU law, which isn't acceptable, or under the EU settlement scheme. So to minimise the risk of making that kind of mistake practically, um, what you could do um, is invite but not require any family members um, of EEA citizens to provide them to provide you with a share code so that you can do the online check rather than the manual check because it, it is it is challenging. To, to tell the difference with these biometric residence cards. Um, in addition to that, the guidance is also stated that the Home Office intends to phase out these biometric residence cards completely as an um, acceptable right to work document from early next year. So again, more change to come on this. Um, so um, just a, a, a kind of um, further points on the right to work check and the follow up process. So um, as we mentioned, um, as the grace period um, for EU settlement scheme was given to the 30th of June, EU nationals could at that point still use their passport and ID card, provided that the check was done um, correctly and there's no need to go back and carry out any retrospective um, checks on their status. So uh, Marianne mentioned that if somebody started work for you um, in the transition period, you don't need, as long as you've done your proper right to work check, you've got the EU, um, passport or ID card, you don't need to carry out a retrospective check. However, a lot of employers feel quite nervous about that. Um, and we've been asked a number of times about whether we should be doing these retrospective checks. There have been some start warnings in the Home Office guidance that says if you do do retrospective audits or checks, you could leave yourself open to discrimination claims. So if you just say to anybody who is an EU citizen, you all need to provide us with your um, status under the EU settlement scheme, arguably that's going to be indirect direct discrimination on the basis of their nationality. So you need to be cautious what you do. So what we would always say in the circumstances is um, if you're looking at retrospective checks or audits, do it for the entire workforce. So audit all of your right to work checks. Um, and as part of that, ask for the EU state, um, settlement status. But again, it's not required um, to do that. Um, and Marianne mm -hmm. mentioned. Sorry, sorry Marianne. See, another point to note actually on that was um, because the Home Office has afforded employers up until the 31st of December this year to help employees rectify their status, if you were concerned about having a stable workforce and finding illegal working down the line, you may wish to consider doing these retrospective checks earlier rather than later, just so you are within that time frame up until the end of this year. That's a good point. And with the, um, the, other, the other point to make as well, is that if you if you conduct a right to work check for a new starter from tomorrow and they haven't applied to the EU settlement scheme yet, they cannot start working for you. So you can't say you can start working for us as long as you within the 28, you, you make the application, we've got this 28 day period. They mustn't start working for you until they have secured their status under the EU settlement scheme. Um, it's only this 28 day period um, going and getting the verification notice, application evidence, all that kind of stuff is just for employees who started with you on or before the 30th of June, um, just, to, just to make that point. So Marianne, do you want to talk about business travel now? Yes, so this is the second part of our webinar today, um, looking at the business visitor side of things. So from the 1st of January, UK nationals going to the EU for business should have checked each respective member state's rules before traveling to ensure that they are not in breach of that member state's immigration permissions. Each state does have differing rules to what can and cannot be done under the visitor rules there. And it should not be assumed that what you can do in the UK as a visitor will automatically be allowed in any member state. 
I mean, UK national traveling to the EU for business is likely to be permitted 90 days in any 180 day period whilst there. So as mentioned earlier, you may have seen the articles about the uh, EU nationals being detained in centres or being questioned vigorously at the borders on arrival in the UK. So it does appear that there has been confusion as to what can and cannot be permitted um, under the visitor rules when coming in. And obviously this, this is probably likely due to the fact that, as we've mentioned, EU passports and ID cards can still be used. So from the 1st of January, it must be remembered that EU nationals coming under the immigration rules must carry out permitted activities. So permitted activities are such things as attending a meeting or attending a conference and signing of contracts and attending trade fairs. There is more flexibility given to intracorporate activities, um, such as providing training or advising and consulting on specific internal projects. So a main point of confusion that does appear in these articles is job seekers. So attending an interview is specifically listed as a permitted activity under the visitor rules, and the Home Office has confirmed that this is, is allowed. And it does make logical sense on the basis of, of a pure reading of the word interview. Saying that, EU nationals must remember that they can come over to job seek, but should they be successful in obtaining a job, they must go home and apply under the correct visa category. And only once that application has been approved, should they then return to the UK to work. They cannot perform their usual day-to-day -day activities whilst in the UK and on visitor visitor rules. However, their principal reason for travel should be included under these permitted activities. EU nationals should be aware of the restrictions in force for the visitor rules and actually be prepared to show evidence such as a return flight ticket to show that they understand the rules and to facilitate their entry when questions at the border. So a potential alternative option for um, business travellers is the Frontier Worker Permit. And I think we had a query in advance of the webinar on, on this permit. So it could be an option which does provide greater flexibility, um, and this is a frontier worker permit. So it may be that you have an EU national who works on a UK contract, but they live overseas. The individual may, on this basis, be eligible to apply for a frontier worker permit, provided that they meet the requirements. And these are roughly as follows. Um, of course, they must be an EU national. Um, they have to primarily live overseas. And this doesn't actually have to be an EU country. Um, and ideally, they must not have stayed in the UK for more than 180 days in any 12 month period. They must also have traveled to the UK in 2020. And they must also have traveled to the UK in the 12 months prior to the application date, although there are some exemptions afforded in this case. A straightforward example of this would be for, um, for a Dutch national who lives in the Netherlands and worked on a UK contract there. And as part of their duties, they travel to the UK occasionally to carry out business duties for the business. Assuming that they traveled in 2020 and taking today's date of the 30th of June, assuming that they then traveled again between the 30th of June last year and today, they should be eligible for the frontier worker permit and have their application approved without any issue. It should be noted that if they are an individual employee, they should also provide evidence of the pay for the work done, so e.g. their pay slips, um, and also include their employment contract to make the process easier. There are other circumstances where the individual can be self-employed whilst working in the UK. Um, and again, there are documents that should be included with the application, for example, invoices of works done in the UK. Less commonly, um, there may be a subcontracting arrangement in place between a UK business and an overseas business. The documentation required in this scenario is likely to be much more onerous, and we would recommend that you seek advice before trying to get anybody to apply under this type of scenario. If the Frontier Worker Permit is granted, the individual can work, reside and rent in the UK, and the permit can be renewed indefinitely, which is quite helpful, on the proviso that they continue to meet the Frontier Worker regulations. The bad point to note on this is that it does not lead to settlement in the UK. And you may think that this is a flexible option for individuals who can contribute and continue to contribute to UK business um, and who do not primarily live here. 
Thanks, Marianne. Um, just by way of example as well, we're currently um, supporting a UK business who work in the renewable energy sector, and they have a very specialist contract um, for which they require, um, is it, they have an EU, they've subcontracted part of the contract out to an EU com um, company um, as they need these particular specialists and there's not the specialism within the UK. And these, in, these um, EU nationals need to travel for this project to the UK and in, in to, to carry out that work for a period of, I think it's about three months. Um, and under the normal um, business travel rules, this would not be a permitted activity. So um, they instructed us to try and assist them with looking for options, but actually this is a regular um, arrangement that they have. So they use this particular um, EU company um, for a number of different contracts over the years. And a, lot, and a number of those workers have traveled over to work on those contracts prior to um, the end of last year. Um, so um, we're assisting them with obtaining 30 um, worker frontier worker permits at the moment and all the different um, documentation that that entails. And that's uh, essentially the only way that they're able to uh, meet their obligations under the contract because of the specialisms in this work. So uh, frontier worker permits is something that kind of came out um, earlier this year um, or towards the end of last year, but um, they are from, from today, they will be checking more at the borders and well, they will be checking at the borders that individuals, EU nationals who are traveling over have a frontier worker permit. Prior to this, they were um, they, they were relatively open at the borders. You could just say that you're a frontier worker and, and, and arrive in the UK. But now, as from today's date, they are saying that they're going to start checking these permits. So it's vital that um, that, that those, those um, EU nationals have the frontier worker permit. And as we mentioned, it is an acceptable right to work if necessary as well. So I just wanted to talk through, um, just to kind of finish off before we get into the Q&A, um, on some alternative options. So um, we mentioned at the beginning about the skilled worker visa um, and that as an option and the, and the changes to that route. Um, for if, if you're wanting to um, engage non-UK nationals, either from the EU or third country nationals, then um, you to come and live and work in the UK, then you do require a sponsor license to do that. So the first step is for the employer to obtain a sponsor license, and then you can sponsor um, non-UK um, citizens to come and work in the UK. Or if they're already here working under a sponsor license for another employer, then they can come and work for you as well. Um, but there are specific requirements for that. It has to be at a certain skill level. There's no route for unskilled workers, and it has to be at a certain salary there is a salary threshold and um, for that as well and as Marianne mentioned there was the resident labour market test but now you just have to demonstrate that there is a genuine vacancy for that role as well and um, we're helping a number of organizations particularly in the hospitality construction um, and absolutely in the tech sector in obtaining these kind of sponsor licenses at the moment, because put simply, there is not the skill set in the UK to fulfill these roles. And um, so they have to look to remain competitive. It is part of their recruitment strategy that they have to look elsewhere um, in order to, um, to fulfill these roles. And it's a big issue in the hospitality sector, but again, no route for unskilled workers. So we're looking at, um, at, at, at more, more, more skilled chefs, um, managers, et cetera, as well. The other option, if you are part of a larger group that has a presence outside of the UK, you could look at intra-company transfer and um, you'll need a visa for that as well. You'll need a sponsor license for that as well. If you want to move people around sites, that's something that we can um, support with as well. And in the 2021 budget, there were various um, suggestions about changes that might take place. There is this um, global business mobility route, um, but that really is simply a rebranding of the representative of an overseas business route. Um, that's due to come in from spring 2022. And then there are also looking at this elite visa, which is aimed at helping fintech and cyber scale ups, but that won't require sponsorship. So that might be quite useful and um, just a, a job offer. And again, the aim for that is to for that to come in um, in, in about March 2022 um, as well. So just before we um, finish and move on to the Q&A and while you're thinking about that, I just wanted to launch a poll. Um, just to see where everybody's at with this. So um, just in relation to um, 
of kind of where you're at. Um, um, so if I just launch that now, you can have a look at it. And if you wouldn't mind just filling that in. So we're just wondering whether you employ migrants who don't require sponsorship, um, i.e. EU nationals, spouse visa holders or students. You have a sponsor license, but you don't sponsor migrants currently. Um, you have a sponsor license, but you do sponsor migrants. You don't have a sponsor license and you don't think that you will. And you don't have a sponsor license, but you're actually thinking about it. I think pretty much everybody has, there's a few still to come, but I will um, end that now and then I'll show you the results. So you should be able to see that now. So um, interestingly, um, only 46% of attendees employ migrants. Um, so any EU citizens who don't require any sponsorship, that's that's lower than, um, than we would expect. So, um, and then 6% have a sponsor license, but don't sponsor migrants. 23% have a sponsor license and do sponsor migrants. Um, 31% don't have a sponsor license and don't think that they will. And we've got 23% who don't have a sponsor license, but are thinking about it. And I think that reflects our understanding of it as well. There are, we've been speaking to a number of organizations who are thinking about the sponsor license and, 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 and putting, uh, including that as part of their longer term recruitment strategy. But as Marianne uh, mentioned earlier on, if you are looking at um, obtaining a sponsor license, it's something that you need to think about sooner rather than later, because the, because, because the Home Office is so overwhelmed with applications for sponsor licenses at the moment, the process can take quite a bit longer than um, initially anticipated. And they are also starting out the, um, starting up again, the Home Office um, audits and compliance checks as well. So if if you do apply for a sponsor license, you need to make sure that you take advice and you understand the obligations for it as well. So um, that brings us to the end of the um, our part of the presentation. So we're now on to any questions and I can see that um, we've got some questions in the Q&A. So if I just kind of go through them and then Marianne and Anne and I can, um, can answer these together. So the first question that we've had is we currently have an employee on a visa from Nigeria, which runs out in 2023. Is there anything as employers that we need to do? I think from my perspective, um, of course, hopefully you have a copy of this visa and you can diarize the end date, which is due to expire. Um, depending on what kind of visa they have, if they are a sponsored worker with you, you would then need to look at, if you still want to employ them, of course, um, renewing their visa, if that's possible. Um, if it's a skilled worker, they can now renew their visas indefinitely. So that's something that's a positive change in the immigration rules that came into force from 1st of December. If it's not something that can be renewed or due to time restraints, you should probably seek advice on what to do in that scenario. Um, but the ultimate concern really is that you have diarised that end date in 2023. And I would suggest doing the first reminder three months ahead of the expiry date so that you can reach out to the individual. It may be that they have a spouse visa, for example, it doesn't require you to sponsor them. Um, in this case, it'd be down to the employee really to renew their own visa off their own back. So that three month notice would allow you and them time to get their affairs in order and to either apply again if they can or if not, Obviously, there needs to be some discussion there. Um, and I would also have diary reminders for three months in advance, two months, one month, and of course, the expiry date, as you will need to see the documents again to do the right to work check um, to ensure that you have provided yourself with a statutory excuse to continue not being liable for civil pen penalties in this scenario. Of course, as soon as they get their visa renewed, you should keep that copy on file as well and do a new right to work check to continue your statutory excuse. Thanks, Marianne. Um, so the next question that we have is that we have um, people engaged with us who are classed as self-employed contractors on the um, CIS scheme. Um, 
If starting one of these colleagues, do we need to carry out right to work checks? I'll take this one. So um, if their person is truly self-employed or a tr truly a self-employed contractor, then you do not need to carry out the normal right to work checks. Um, however, a, a number of employers will still, a number of businesses will still do this because of the, mainly because of the PR side, if it subsequently turns out that somebody who is a self-employed contractor actually doesn't have the right to work check. So there's, the answer to this is there's no legal obligation on you to do so, but in the circumstances you may want to do this. Um, in addition to that, um, if you have um, somebody who works through an employment agency um, or somebody who's been introduced in that way, you often see, just to kind of add on to this, you often see that an agency will say, we've done the right to work check, they can come and start working for you. Um, if they're engaged directly by you, you will still you will need to do your own right, right to work check, not rely on the agency's one, unless, the, unless it's a different kind of arrangement. So um, yeah, in, in relation to truly self-employed, no need to do right to work checks. You'd probably want it built into your um, your contracts with them as well, your legal contracts to say that they have the right to work. So uh, presumably you will have a, an agreement with those individuals, a self-employed contractors type of arrangement, and it will confirm in there that they have the right to work in the UK. If it's sub, if, if you are in a situation where you have a self-employed contractor, in this in the scenario similar to what we were saying before, where you have EU, um, if, if they're employed by an EU company, but but they're actually coming over to work on a contractor consultancy basis for you, then you'll, you would want to understand whether or not they have a frontier worker permit or whether or not they have the right to work under it in a different route in any event. So um, the, the answer legally is no, but practically probably yes. Um, next question, um, what checks need to be done for employees that started before the 1st of January 2021? So the answer to that really is that as long as your right to work check was done properly when they started working for you and you're comfortable with that, you don't need to do anything. Um, you have the statutory excuse if you've kept the records on that basis, but some employees employers may want to carry out right, um, retrospective checks um, or an audit to ensure that everything is in place. And you can certainly ask for their status under the EU settlement scheme, but you can't require it if that makes sense. So the next question, um, is there a summary of all the do's and don'ts requiring right to work checks as lots of conflicting information to get our heads around? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's the, so true. It's absolutely true, isn't it, Marianne? You and I have trawled the government guidance on this. I mean, if you wanted to read the government guidance, that is that is something that you can do. We've hopefully summarised it as much as we can today. Um, with right to work checks in general, um, you would want to have a policy in place that is clear on what the do's and don'ts are so that your staff who conduct the recruitment processes are aware of what you need to do. Um, I would say it's absolutely vital to do that and that's something that we, um, we, we can support with if any business need that. In addition to that we will be running the specific right to work check training. It's very difficult for us to cover everything in the short time that we've been allowed today um, and we'll cover, um, we'll cover more of that in, in, in that session as well. I think the normal thing that we say is ask for the right to work documents at the office stage, which then should hopefully give you time um, to actually see these documents. And if you're not sure, either seek advice and, and we can obviously help you with that so that you know what you do and you cannot do um, in those circumstances. And the, and the visa type that you are showed will actually give you the sort of, that, that will lead to what kind of check needs to be done. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, this is a really good question. Can an umbrella company employ an EU worker with a frontier worker permit in order to payroll them or would they need a sponsor license? So um, that's a good, that is a good question. And um, the answer to that is if they, if the individual has a frontier worker permit, you can engage them as long as it's in line with the rules of the, the frontier worker permit. So you can't work for a certain period of time, et cetera, et cetera, as well. Um, you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't need a sponsor license, but the, it would be very limited in scope in the time that they could, they could come and work for you. And you would need to ensure that you act in line with, um, you know, they, 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 you act in line with the with the terms of that permit um, 
in the circumstances. Um, there are also, and this is out with our area of expertise, there are potential tax implications as well um, that, that, that come with that. If you have somebody who is um, based um, in the UK, so based outside of the UK, who's coming to work temporarily in the EU, the, um, in the UK, there may well be some, where do they pay tax? Where do they pay social security? All that kind of stuff as well. And that's a question um, that, that is out with our area of expertise. Marianne, have you got anything to add on that? Um, no, not on that one, no. That's fine. Um, and then the next question, is it possible to do online checks for all third country nationals or will there be exceptions dependent on visa types? Marianne, do you want to take this yes, one? Yes, so it's the, the short answer is it does depend on what kind of visa that they hold. Um, biometric residence permits and biometric residence card holders should be able to use the online service. But again, if they have a physical document, you can't be mandating that they do use the online service. Um, Stasis that are issued under the digital route, for example, a frontier worker permit, um, this is a tricky one because many frontier worker permits will be issued digitally and then you can only use the online service. However, if for some reason they haven't been able to use their um, biometric chip in their passport to apply, they will likely be given a physical document. And of course, then you'll need to do the manual check. Um, so in short, the answer really does depend on what type of visa they physically hold, whether it's online or it is a physical paper document. Um, but it, I think now, the, from what I've been reading, the Home Office is now trying to make right to work checks and the permission shown more digital they do have a project for digitizing this kind of permission and um, so going forward i think next year um assuming that the home office is in on time they're looking to have everything digitized by roughly this time next year and we've said um we'll, we'll obviously have to see how that pans out um with, with how they go forward with that thanks mariam so the final question we've got on there for now unless anybody else wants to add anything um extra we have an employee from romania who has been with us for over two years it has come to our attention that he has not applied to the test to the settlement scheme. What are our obligations with regard to this person um, in that we know he has not got settled status? We have the right to work check document documented from when he joined. So this is um, very much um, a so great um, summary of kind of what we're discussing today. So um, as he's worked for you for two years, he will and, and been within the UK for two years, he will he is eligible to apply for um, under the EU settlement scheme. So you are fully aware of that. So there's no concerns at this point that he doesn't have the right to work. So he with with this particular individual, you as from tomorrow. So unless he, I would speak to him today and say you need to apply today. Um, absolutely need to apply today. It's vital that you do. If ask him again tomorrow, if he hasn't applied tomorrow, then you've got that 28 day period um, in which he then needs to apply, provide you with his evidence of application. And this was the bit that Marianne covered. So Marianne, if you want to take the over on this bit, you have to get the positive, the verification notice yes. don't, from the yes. so from the of course, service. Yeah, so hopefully he does have, he or she does have a valid reason as to why they haven't applied yet. Um, so. If you do speak to them and they haven't applied, hopefully they can do this by today. And um, if not, and it falls into tomorrow, they will have 28 days to make the application. They should then be issued with a certificate of application. And this is likely to be emailed to them and have a PDF attachment, which you should retain on file. If they have validly made that application, you will need to check this with the Home Office on the employer checking service. So you'll need to have a certificate of application and then go off and do the employer checking service. Hopefully this will come back as positive and you'll receive a positive verification notice. You need to keep both of those documents on file because that will give you the six month statutory excuse that you need to keep employing this person. And in that time, so say that they apply tomorrow because they, they can't do it today for whatever reason, hopefully from tomorrow, the home office will accept their reason for applying late and in this case, six months from now, after you've received your positive verification notice, that application should have been decided by the Home Office. And this remaining individual can then provide you with their status under the scheme. Unless, of course, they can switch. They might, they might be eligible to switch into a different visa category, but that's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, so that's what we would recommend that you do. Speak to them today, get them to do the application today, and then if not... 28 days from tomorrow, it would seem like if they haven't done it by today. I think it's really vital that you make this employee aware 
that if they don't apply today and they don't have a good reason for doing so, and um, so we went through the different reasons, then they're not going to be able to apply and you will have to bring their employment to an end. Because the, the reality is, if this, if this individual, if this employee doesn't apply and doesn't have a good reason, then, um, then you can't continue to employ them. So um, I think they need to be made very, very aware of the, the implications of their non-application today. It makes their life much easier if they apply for it today rather than tomorrow. So mm -hmm. there you go, whoever, whoever asked that question, it was an anonymous <laughs> question. You've got to race off down the hall and find this <laughs> individual and get them to apply. Lovely. Well, we've now reached 11 o'clock and I can't see any more questions that have come along. So um, you'll see Marianne and I's details um, on the slide. If anybody has any other questions, um, hopefully we've covered everything that you want to cover today. But if there's anything else you want to us to cover, then just drop us a line. As I mentioned, we'll be sending around the slides and a recording of this session. And we'd really ask, we're going to send you some feedback, uh, feedback questionnaire as well. And we really appreciate if you filled that in because um, it does enable us to carry out events um, that are as popular as this one and um, that are relevant to you and your organization. So um, I hope you enjoy the end of deadline day and um, we will see you all soon. Thank you.